Good morning and welcome to your next uh, video lesson on the Anglo-Saxon England and Anglo-Norman Kingdom component for your History A level. Um, I've taken a, a slightly different turn on uh, where we're going for, for this next lesson, but it makes sense considering the content that we covered last time on William and uh, his brother Robert particularly. So if you want to use the sheet that I provided or if you want to just uh, get this down in your own notes, I'm going to make this a relatively short lesson. There's not too much content that you need to know. Um, but if you can get that down, it says, what was Scotland ever a serious threat to the reign of William II? So main uh, points today are to outline the events of Anglo-Scottish relations during this period uh, of, of the reign of William II and to remind ourselves of William I's dealings with Scotland. That is going to be helpful to explain why William Rufus was able to successfully deal with King Malcolm III uh, or Malcolm Canmore, as he's sometimes known and the subsequent issue of Scotland, and then to finally make a decision on whether Scotland ever posed a serious threat to the Normans uh, at all. Now, what I would suggest that you do um, is that you pause the video at this particular point and look back over your notes that we did on um, William I's relationship with Scotland. It'd be useful for you to have that context and to see how essentially it's been left. Um, if you have any issues with that, just drop me an email and um, I'll, I'll send over the resources to you. If you pause the video at this point, just have a read back through and then we'll move on. So uh, just to say where we're at with the, the distant learning part of the course, um, the part that's in green there are the elements that we've already looked at. So we've got a little bit left of that, that Normandy course uh, left. So we've got to look at uh, Robert of Normandy's decision to go on a crusade. That's how I left the last video. But I did think that it made sense to actually just just jump back um, and do this very small topic that's slightly in isolation of William II and Scotland between 1091 and 93. Um, chronologically, it's pro probably the best order in which to do this. But I think if we try and cover everything to do with William II, then move on to Henry I, it will make a bit more sense from a, from a chronological standpoint. So after this particular lesson and on Thursday, Instead of moving on again back to stuff to do with Normandy, we'll be looking at William II's conflict with the church as well. So that means hopefully by the end of this week, we have tied up everything to do with William II. And what I'll be doing is I'll be setting a little bit of work um, for you to hand in uh, for, for the, the week after the subsequent week, um, which won't be necessarily in the same format that we've done so far. So everything that we've done so far has been um, you know, take the picture, show me what you've done for your work and uh, you know that's that's basically just a, a tick box exercise instead i'll, I'll be setting something uh, which i'd like you to complete but hopefully uh, won't you know won't be too onerous on you if there was a 20 mark question on the issue of scotland again i think it would be surprising it's quite a niche topic uh, but if it was there i think that the question would likely be scotland posed a considerable threat to the safety and security of norman monarchs how far do you agree and the point for this particular question is that you'd have to look at William the first response and William the second's response as well. I think it would be highly unlikely that a 20 mark question would be there about William the second's response to the Scottish uh, threat. Uh, it's, it's too niche as a question. I think it's more likely as an undergraduate essay. So I think they'll probably look at both William the first and William the second together. Hence why I asked you to just uh, revise uh, a few issues um, with the issues that William the, fa uh, William the first faced. Uh, with Scotland. If you were to uh, you know, go for this kind of question uh, and approach this question, um, there's two approaches. I don't think option one is appropriate. Option one would be, yes, they were a threat. No, they weren't a threat. It's too simplistic. And I think actually it wouldn't give you that advantageous chronological approach that, that would perhaps be necessary for a conclusion to say it was uh, a threat for William I, it wasn't a threat for William II or, or vice versa. So I think the approach in which you'd go for this question would be Take the first half of the essay, concentrate on William the first, concentrate on the key moments. So approach it a little bit chronologically and then analyse the, the key moments uh, that William the first had to deal with, uh, particularly Malcolm Canmore or mainly Malcolm Canmore and then William the second exactly the same as well. So the approach of this particular video lesson will be relatively straightforward. It's not going to be as long, perhaps, as the, the other tasks. Uh, and what I'm going to ask you to do is, is essentially just note take um, and I've given you the pro forma for that. So hopefully it should be relatively straightforward. So the year that, that we need to start with is, is 1091 um, rather than you know, 1087 when, when William uh, comes to the throne. Uh, the reason why is um, there is an immediate threat 
uh, that Malcolm poses to to the domestic affairs of England in 1091. But that doesn't negate the fact that there has been issues with Anglo-Scottish relations in the previous few, few years before that. So Simon of Durham, for example, um, stated, uh, this is slightly after 1091, but it shows the contemporary problem that, that England faced, that there was scarcely a Scottish household without an English uh, slave, male or female. Um, and this is the problem that we noted when we looked at William I, that border reaving, border raiding, as it's sometimes called, um, was was a, pre a prevalent problem you know, going back you know, decades. This isn't something new. And this issue of Scotland hasn't gone away with the problem with the way in which William I is, is trying to deal with Malcolm Canmore. You, you're going to have local Scottish lords who are going to you know, reave into those those northern English uh, counties and are going to, to take slaves. And um, that is something that, that is continuing to be a problem up until 1091. But in 1091, um, the threat becomes a little bit more immediate for William um, and Robert as well. So the instigator of the, the 1091 campaign is Malcolm Canmore. Uh, this picture that you've got here, Malcolm's the, the, the guy on the left. Um, Malcolm Canmore decides in 1091 to raid or launch a, an expedition into England, into the heart of, of England. It doesn't go that far, it's only you know to the north, um, but it's the first major expedition uh, that Malcolm has made for a long time, you know, back from the 1070s, really. So with Malcolm having done that, um, it, it raises a problem of, of domestic uh, domestic security for, for William. But why then did Robert decide to help William and, and go and, and, and try and deal with Malcolm Canmore? Well, the answer lies with the lady who's the, the central focus for this particular picture. Um, this is St. Margaret of Scotland. She wasn't a saint, obviously, at the time, um, but she's somebody that holds a, a, a lot of importance for, for Scottish history uh, and Scottish med medieval history. Um, Margaret is the, the sister of Edgar Aifling um, and the daughter of Edward uh, the Exile. She's, she's the descendant from the Anglo-Saxon um, kings and, and can trace a lineage back to uh, Alfred the Great, but you know, even you know, quite recently as well, uh, people like Ethelred the Unready, um, and Edmund Ironside. So Margaret of Scotland is the queen consort, so the queen of um, Malcolm the Third Canmore, and and has been so for a while. But by 1091, the situation's quite different. Edgar Aithling, this continuing problem, her brother, um, is back in the Scottish court, um, and what that shows is that there's potentially again this this lineage that could usurp or disrupt the Norman kings of England. Um, added to that, Margaret and Malcolm um, have been successful in producing male heirs to the throne. So I think there's six, six male surviving heirs at this particular point, um, and added to that are a number of other in, um, daughters uh, who potentially could be used to marry uh, into other royal families and, and secure alliances. So Malcolm and, and Margaret have been um, husband and wife for a number of years now, but they've successfully secured their, their lineage. And that lineage poses a threat to William Rufus and Robert if they're to hold on to uh, England and Normandy. So the 1091 campaign is incredibly short-lived. It's, it's not something that historians can pour over and can look at the logistics of the campaign and um, it, it's pretty straightforward what happens is that um, Robert and William return from Normandy after their um, their alliance uh, that, that Treaty of Cannes or Treaty of Rouen um, and they get a fleet of 50 grain ships um, from the south of England and the plan of action is is pretty straightforward um, the ships will uh, sail in the North Sea towards Edinburgh, um, towards the estuary there, which is the, called the Firth of the Fourth. And at the same time, um, you would have Robert and William marching north as well. Um, they would both meet uh, in, in the Firth of the Fourth, so around Edinburgh, and either would fight Malcolm Campbell or would ask him to submit. Um, what happens is, is pretty straightforward. Um, the fleet was actually wrecked in a storm um, but the power in which it showed 50, uh, you know, 50 grain um, ships going to Scotland 
Um, it, it was a symbolic gesture more than anything else. And, and added to the fact that you've got William and Robert together, so the Duke of Normandy, the King of England, marching north in a combined front to deal with Malcolm Canmore was enough for Malcolm to, uh, to submit. So there was no pitch battle at all. Um, and in the words of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Malcolm came to uh, William and became his man just as he had been to his father, William the Conqueror. Um, he affirmed it with an oath and King William promised to restore him the land and all things he had held under his father. So it seems like crisis averted, problem solved, no big issue whatsoever. Uh, and a bit of an anti-climax uh, more than anything else. So he's he's gone for a defensive measure. He's secured the, the English border for the time being. Malcolm hasn't necessarily lost anything. Uh, it seems like everybody's a winner. But in 1092... William Rufus goes on the offensive, and this is, is quite unusual. This hasn't been done before, um, and this is something that you know we, we see politicians and we see kings and queens after this particular point uh, doing on, on a regular basis. But with William Rufus, this is perhaps the first time that we see it from an English king. So this is the extract from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and it's, it's remarkable for the, the fact that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has talked about this year in as much detail and has mentioned this. That shows in itself that it's significant, because usually if there's a, a, an event, it's relatively short. This is actually quite extensive um, for, you know, for, for what might appear to be quite a small uh, event. So if you read through it as well, in this year, King William, with a great army, went north to Carlisle and restored the town and built the castle and drove out Dolphin, who ruled the land there before. And he garrisoned the castle with his vassals, and thereafter came south hither and sent thither a great multitude of folk with women and cattle, there to dwell and till the land. Now translations are a little bit different, and you'll find it, you know, in in different books. It, it might say a number of different words, um, but the points are are quite clear. So where you've got your space on your pro forma about 1092, you can write down some of these points. So Dolphin of Carlisle was um, essentially Malcolm Canmore's man. Uh, and if you have a look at that map, you can see that Carlisle um, is located uh, pretty much in the centre. Um, Carlisle at this particular point was part of Scotland. Nowadays it's not, it's, it's a town in England, um, but Carlisle was uh, part of the region of Strathclyde and un under the control of, the, of, of Malcolm Canmore. In 1092, William, with an army, decides that Carlisle is now going to be a focal point um, to prevent border reaving. Now, what he does very specifically here that's that's new is he colonizes Carlisle. He doesn't just get rid of Dolphin and launch an army and then return home like previous kings have done and, and perhaps like he's done in 1091. He he sends people and he gives them incentives to, to go and live in Carlisle and, and to make sure that that's an English town. Now, if we cast our minds back to how William was trying to get control in the in the Burgesses and the towns of England, uh, King, you know, William the First, uh, I'm meaning, uh, we know that he gave incentives for Normans to come over. And actually, this is quite similar in that same regard. But this is to deal with this Scottish threat. And, and really what we have here is we have a uh, first example of, of colonisation. And this leads us to the unusual events of 1093, which um, really I don't think anyone was was expecting and moves very, very quickly. So Malcolm is clearly angry uh, with what's occurred in Carlisle um, and that the oath of 1091 has been broken. And he asked to meet William Rufus. Now, if, if two kings are meeting, the logical place to meet would be at the border. Um, so that would be the, the right way of doing things. Uh, instead, Malcolm invites um, uh, Malcolm is invited to Gloucester by uh, William Rufus um, to meet with him in August 1093. Now, the suggestion um, might be, well, if he's asking him to meet in Gloucester, then it's not necessarily a meeting of equals. It could be quite a threatening meeting. But William does provide him with an escort through England um, and he provides him with hostages. Um, so by hostages, um, it's a uh, somebody who might be quite important to the Royal Court of England is, is essentially sent to Scotland um, as, as, a, as a hostage in case anything happens. So it's kind of like a guarantee. Uh, remember at this time as well, if you, if you cast your mind back to William the Conqueror, Malcolm uh, III's son uh, is, is, is actually in 
uh, in, in England as a hostage already. Um, his name's uh, Duncan, and we'll come back to him as well. Um, so there is the suggestion that Malcolm and William were wanting to meet each other, and, and both of them uh, wanted to kind of come up with a solution. On Malcolm's journey down uh, England, um, he actually visits his daughter, Edith, and, and remember the name. Um, Edith will be quite important later. Um, Edith is, is Malcolm and Margaret's daughter, um, so she has lineage that can be traced back to Alfred the Great. And when Malcolm meets her um, at Priory, he's incredibly, sorry, not Priory, uh, Wilton Abbey, um, he's incredibly annoyed and angry because she's been veiled like a nun. And the suggestion perhaps was that Malcolm went to um, what went to Wilton Abbey specifically to um, perhaps pick up Edith and use her as the bargaining chip for this particular meeting. Remember, William Rufus isn't married. Um, Edith has a lineage that can be traced back to Alfred the Great. It would have been a really useful bargaining chip for Malcolm to stop any further issues between England and Scotland. Um, they, they meet supposedly at Gloucester, um, but there's not really much to be said about the meeting at all. Um, I mean, we don't really even have any record of, uh, as to what happened. Some people are actually suggesting that they didn't even meet at Gloucester. Um, we're not too sure about that. But what we do know is that Malcolm and William agree nothing uh, and that Malcolm is particularly annoyed and he hastily goes back to Scotland and readies an army um, to attack England. Now, the fact that this all starts in August and by November he's readying an army suggests that this is is getting out of control quite quickly. But the thing that is quite surprising is that in November 1093, uh, Malcolm and his eldest son, um, so the heir to the Scottish throne, are ambushed by Robert Mowbray, who is the Duke of, of, of Norm, uh, Northumberland, um, and they are killed. Now, the... Sorry, not Duke of, of Northumberland, it's the Earl of, of Northumberland. Um, it's just a, a small semantic difference. Um, they're ambushed and killed on the 13th of November. Um, but this isn't necessarily organised by William Rufus. It, it's just maybe a, a happy coincidence that takes place. In actual fact, William can save face um, and, and is able to say that he didn't authorise this um, and that you know, kings shouldn't be killing other kings in, in such a manner. It's not chivalric at all. Um, but he has essentially eliminated this this growing threat of, of Malcolm Canmore. Supposedly as well, um, Queen Margaret dies three days later after her husband and her son's death um, out of grief. So at the end of 1093, King Malcolm III Canmore is dead. Margaret of Scotland, his wife, is dead. Uh, and their eldest surviving son, Edmund of Scotland, is also dead. So the, the obvious choice as to who should get the, the throne um, following Malcolm and Edmund's death uh, would be the next surviving eldest son, um, which in this case would be Edgar. Now, the unusual thing that we have is that Duncan, um, who is also Malcolm's son, was from a previous marriage. Um, and we could therefore say that he should be king. And, and as a result, we have this succession crisis in Scotland that sparked from the, the murders of 1093. This is incredibly advantageous to William, the third, uh, William Rufus. And as a consequence, um, he exploits it to, to his advantage. Uh, and if we're looking at one of William's greatest successes, um, Gillingham's, um, Gillingham's uh, argument, the historian, um, is that William Rufus is able to effectively appease and solve the Scottish question for the next 40 years, really up until 1136, by what he does. So let's go through the, the main series of events of 1094 and 97. And if you just, as you're, um, as you're listening through, just take a few notes as to what happens at each particular point. So the first thing to note is that the Scottish um, uh, leading nobleman at this particular part, uh, point decided that the person who should be king of Scotland wasn't Edgar, wasn't David, wasn't Duncan, wasn't the sons of Malcolm III, but actually Malcolm III's brother, Donald. Now, Donald Bain becomes king uh, in 1093. Sorry, this is my attempt of, of drawing a crown. Um, and 
Uh, he obviously is is angry that his his brother has died, and he's certainly not William Rufus's or England's man at all. Um, really, if if he was to continue being uh, king, um, it, it, we're going to see further issues with with England and Scotland potentially at war with each other. We know this because uh, Donald uh, III, or Donald Bain as he's sometimes known, um, drove out all the English that were associated with the previous regime. So he wants to essentially de-Anglicise the, the Scottish uh, court. Um, this is where Rufus takes an active part um, in the, the, the affairs of, of the Scottish court. And so what he does is he encourages Malcolm's hostage son, Duncan, um, which uh, you can see um, I've already circled in green. Uh, he encourages Duncan to go north with English and Norman support. Um, and Duncan has some initial success. Um, he's able to usurp his uncle uh, Donald Bain and is able to take the throne for a very short period in 1094. So in 1094, for a very short period, there is a puppet leader of Scotland, so somebody that has essentially been put there by the, the English and the Normans. Donald um, Ban, unfortunately for the English, however, takes back the throne in 1094 and he kills his nephew Duncan and, and he rules the country between 1094 and 1097. However, William's not to be deterred on this particular point. Um, he knows the problems of Donald Bain becoming um, being King of Scotland um, and he knows that in 1094 that short period of, of destabilising Scotland is going to lead to better security in England. Remember an enemy uh, divided um, is, is going to be far more advantageous to, this, to the security of England. So by 1097 um, what, in, uh, what William Rufus has done is he's chosen as his champion Edgar. Now Edgar is um, the the second surviving uh, son, a uh, legitimate son of, of Malcolm Canmore and Margaret of, of Scotland. Edgar um, has been in, in uh, England, he's been uh, in exile uh, as a consequence of, of the death of his brother Duncan, or half-brother Duncan, and William provides him with troops, uh, with money, um, with support, so that by 1097 he's able to, to set him up proper as King of Scotland. Um, and he rules the country up until uh, 1107, so past the reign of William, um, William II. Now, Edgar becoming king essentially solves this problem of Scotland because Edgar is indebted to William Rufus for giving him the throne. So from 1097 up until 1100, the, the end of William II's reign, um, this is incredibly advantageous. The other reason why um, we don't see problems uh, with Scotland after this, and why we don't see any issues with, with Henry, um, is that when Henry becomes King of England, the person that he marries is Edgar's sister, Edith. So Edith, we mentioned earlier, who had been veiled like a nun, um, she can trace her lineage back to um, Edward the Exile and, and further on to, to Alfred the Great. So Henry um, and Edith securing this marriage alliance also uh, signals the end of, of negative or, or, or poor Anglo-Scottish relations during this period. So, in summary, uh, if we're to, to look at William II's dealings with Scotland, we could say that we can categorise them into three separate stages. The first is, is through force, which we can see in the 1091 reprisal uh, following the, the march of Malcolm Canmore. This is a, a tactic that's been done before. Uh, it's been done by his father, William the Conqueror, um, and it, it does have a certain degree of, of success. His second approach was to con uh, colonise the, uh, the Scottish uh, border region, particularly Carlisle, which angers Malcolm Canmore, but also secures um, the, 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 the there's going to be less uh, border reaving um, from from the Scots. And finally, and perhaps the most crucial one, he intervenes in the foreign internal politics of Scotland to destabilise it enough so that Scotland is at war with itself rather than being at war with England. 
Thanks very much for listening on this one. If you can take a picture, just send it through to me via email. That would be really straightforward. Uh, it's good for you as well. Um, and on Thursday, we will be looking at the final topic, really, of William II's reign before we look at his death. Um, and so Thursday's lesson will be focused in on William II's relationship with the church. Thanks very much for listening.